Diversionary Theory of War. This is, believe it or not, a U.S. battleship in Havana Harbor, the Maine. A very popular assumption, particularly in the press, is the diversionary theory of war, in which a state's leadership elite anticipates outcomes of domestic violence caused either by domestic or economic conflict and decides to divert the intention of their population from the problems at home by starting a war against an exaggerated external threat. For example, the Russian interior minister, who is responsible for police, before the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War stated, quote, what this country needs is a short victorious war to stem the tide of revolution, close quote. Now this is different, meaning diversionary war is different from scapegoating, in which leaders blame foreigners for domestic problems, but don't necessarily act on them, and so it's not necessarily a cause of war. This is typified by, say, Idi Amin, uh, who chased the East Indians out of Uganda in the 1970s. Or there's a rally around the flag effect in which populations support a leader as a result of an external threat. We saw the huge increase in popular support for U.S. President George Bush after the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. An example of the effect of the rally around the flag effect is the Falklands War victory under the leadership of British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher added between 5 and 6 percent to the British Conservative Party's support level in the 1983 elections in the subsequent year. It was found that during the Cold War, U.S. presidential popularity ratings increased by 4 to 5 percent for a short period of time following a conflictual behavior with the Soviet Union, but dropped by 2 percent following cooperative behavior with the Soviet Union. So this is uh, an aspect of the rally around the flag effect, and its basic logic of hawkish nationalism is based on the in-groupism, out-groupism logic. Generally, facing declining support relative to political challengers or political alternatives, either because of economic issues or domestic turmoil, leaders have a number of options. Well, they can improve the economy, they can address or suppress the domestic turmoil, or alternately, they can shift the public attention abroad, which is termed externalization. Logically, the expected utility of externalization, meaning the success payoff, times the probability, minus the penalty of defeat, times the probability of that, should be lower than dealing with the domestic issues. If it's cheaper to solve the domestic problem, you should solve the domestic problem. But if it's cheaper to start a war abroad, and that war is not going to get out of hand, then it's logical to start a war abroad. So these policies that link economic decline and its link to external war matter more for major powers than for minor powers. Uh, there's a couple of popular movies where small countries start wars in order to get invaded and rebuilt. But you know, I, I remind a, I'm reminded of, a, of a, an autobiography where a Japanese sailor on the Yamato battleship during the Second World War, a very young sailor who just joined, commented to one of his friends that was recorded that, you know what, if Japan loses the war, and, and they were going to lose the war within 18 months, then America will simply help us rebuild Japan. So, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon idea for people to be so cynical as to think, well, you know, at the end, we're just going to get rebuilt by whoever uh, defeated us. Uh, but recall that uh, East Germany was not rebuilt by the Soviet Union, so uh, being defeated does not always lead uh, to being rebuilt. But um, uh, small countries uh, are not quite as safe in starting wars, where big countries, uh, they can start safer wars because they can always pick on smaller countries. So you'd expect bigger countries to engage in externalization than smaller countries. Uh, do remember what uh, Thucydides remarked in the uh, Melian debate, which is that strong countries do what they can and the small countries uh, do what they must, uh, which you know basically translates to the big countries have a lot more freedom of choice. So what's the statistical evidence? Well, there's been a lot of theorizing about the scapegoat hypothesis, but very little generalizability or universally applicable specific testing. Most of the statistical testing has been carried out in regard to democracies, and some theories argue that it's within democracies that scapegoating is most likely to occur. 
Economic downturns do not affect the participation of developing states in disputes including war. Now, I'm not so sure. If you look at communist states like Ceausescu's Romania in the 1980s, uh, that state put a significant emphasis on nationalism and uh, actually marginalized uh, a lot of the minorities, the, particularly the Hungarians in uh, Timisoara and uh, Transylvania. However, a major assumption of diversionary theory as applied to democracies is that state leaders are both smarter and more warlike than their citizens. What Noam Chomsky has identified as the crucial influence of the press seems to play a role in the 1898 Spanish-American War. So between 1895 and 1898, there was a revolt in Cuba that was brutally suppressed by Spain, and this provoked moral indignation in the United States. U.S. pressure forced Spain to remove their local military commander. Here you can see in the newspaper, the destruction of the warship Maine was the work of the enemy. On February 15, 1898, a visiting U.S. warship, the Maine, exploded, killing 260 crewmen. On March 21st, a U.S. Naval Court of Inquiry concluded the explosion came from outside the ship and therefore was probably the result of Spanish soldiers. Popular outrage in the U.S. spread very quickly, stirred up in no part by the newspapers. And this led to strong legislative pressure on U.S. President William McKinley to declare war. And this followed on April 25, 1898. The U.S. very quickly conquered Cuba, then Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, basically uh, sweeping up the Spanish uh, imperial possessions in the Americas and Asia, and peace followed in the Treaty of Paris, signed on December 10, 1898. President McKinley did not want to declare war, and he resisted it strongly. Quote, he led his country unhesitatingly toward a war which he did not want for a cause in which he did not believe. Close quote. The press, owned by the Hearst family and the Pulitzer families, pushed the war and altered the hostile perception of Spain, meaning they made it look hostile, uh, even though it was effectively a democratic state. Evidence since the war has indicated that the main, the warship that exploded in Havana Harbor that triggered the war, was a boiler explosion. There was no sabotage involved at all. Testing the diversionary theory of war is difficult. In every state, there will be some faction that can be found that believes war is a solution to domestic population problems. Rather, what is required is evidence of this by the key leader who would bear the consequences of this action if it were to succeed or fail. When I mean fail, I mean if you start a war to distract your population and then the war goes terribly wrong and you pay an enormous price, that would be a failure, even if the population is diverted. It is also necessary to falsify alternative explanation. The principal alternative explanation is that State A went to war against State B, not because of diversion, but because they saw the war as legitimate. I propose that the likelihood of diversionary theory of war depends on the degree of the government's contact with the public and the public's independent access to information. The more the population has independent access to information, the less likely the government is able to have a diversionary war. So let's make some observations. There is an association with diversionary behavior and non-overwhelming domestic unrest, which means when the domestic unrest is not about to completely overthrow the state. High unemployment, high inflation, slow economic growth, a robust opposition, and low approval ratings. This is according to the study by McLaughlin and Prinz. A more fine-grained study found that democracies have the greatest incentive to engage in diversionary war, but they also face the fewest opportunities. I and mean, who are they going to attack? The prevailing evidence is that inflation is not associated with externalization, at least in democracies. And Galbats found that democracies do not engage in diversionary behavior during elections, which is counterintuitive because you'd think that's exactly the time that you'd engage in diversionary behavior. In another statistical study, it was found that in polyarchic states, if you recall that's the definition of a democracy for Robert Dahl, there is no link between internal and external violence. So for countries like US or India or Japan, there is no link. 
In centrist states, such as ones run by the military or party-run totalitarian states, there's only a weak relationship. So, say for example, the Soviet Union, Saudi Arabia, uh, Burma, Pakistan, you're not going to get diversionary behavior there. However, in personalist states, states where you've got a cult of personality, there's actually a negative relationship indicating a possible scapegoating effect, where, which means that you're going to blame people on the outside, but you're not actually going to go to war. And so you find this in Guatemala or Iraq. So we can therefore use regime type to specify the likelihood. Diversionary theory is least likely to explain war and democracies, where populations are most conscious of the costs of war. Military regimes are disconnected from symbolic domestic issues and therefore unresponsive to popularity issues. Authoritarian regimes, which rely on a mixture of military force and popular support, are the most prone for diversionary causes of war. So let's apply diversionary theory and test it in the case of the Falklands War. You can see in the map on the right the Falkland Islands, what the Argentinians call Las Malvinas, off the coast of Argentina. On April 2nd, 1982, a 2,000-man task force of Argentine soldiers seized control of the Falkland Islands, termed in Argentina Las Malvinas. The Royal Navy was dispatched from England to the South Atlantic in order to stop the Argentinians and retake the islands. And on May 21st, Royal Marines landed on the islands, culminating in an Argentine surrender on June 14th, 1982, two and a half months later. This is East and West Falkland Islands, and the capital is at Port Stanley, which is on the extreme east. A popular explanation for the Falklands War is that the military government of General Galtieri was trying to win popular support and weather a serious economic crisis in the early 1980s and therefore sought war to divert the attention of their population. I would like to show you that there is no evidence that the war was initiated by the military leadership with this intent despite the economic crisis. Rather, Argentina attacked the Falkland Islands because the military genuinely believed it belonged to Argentina. You can see General Menendez on the left being greeted by General Galtieri before his departure to the Falkland Islands. You can see a British ship on the right that's been struck by an Exocet missile fired by the Argentine Air Force. Here is General Galtieri, the leader of Argentina, celebrating in the streets of Buenos Aires after the Argentinian seizure of Las Malvinas. Clearly, his popularity has increased from the invasion. Why wouldn't he have conquered Las Malvinas? The 1970s and early 1980s in Argentina was a period of successive military governments and persistent leftist terrorist threats to the political order. In 1978, Argentina had narrowly missed a war with Chile over the Beagle Channel in the Tierra del Fuego, but nonetheless necessitating a large deployment of forces to ensure Argentina's position in that distant part of the territory. In December 1981, after only nine months of rule, President of the Nation, Lieutenant General Roberto Viola, was overthrown in a coup by a new junta made up of three individuals. Admiral Jorge Isaac Anaya of the Navy, Brigadier General Arturo Basilio Lamidozo of the Air Force, and the new Argentine President, Lieutenant General Leopoldo Fortunato Galtieri of the Army. Those individuals are depicted in the picture on the slide. In 1977, the then head of the Navy, Admiral Macera, instructed Ama Anaya to prepare a plan to invade the Falkland Islands, codenamed Operation Goa. Macera proposed the plan to then present Lieutenant General Rafael Videla, not for its intrinsic value, but to undermine Videla's support among the other military services. When Macera, when Macera failed in his goal, due mainly to the Argentine fear of the British submarine fleet within the Navy, he continued to have Anaya prepare the invasion plan in the event that his bluff was called. When Macera failed to undermine Videra, his invasion plan was forgotten. It became dormant. But not until the Army and the Navy and the Air Force had all agreed that 
seizing the Las Malvinas was an important national goal that eventually it would have to be repatriated to Argentinian possession. Now, most of the Navy, including Anaya, had been very disappointed by the intervention of the Vatican that cancelled the Argentine conquest of the Chilean island of Picton, Lenox, and Nueva in Tierra del Fuego. And he therefore transferred his frustration to the Falkland Islands invasion plan, which he had prepared. With Macera, Anaya had also built up the Navy as a powerful service in its own right, with its own naval air force operating off of an aircraft carrier and land bases, and ground forces in the form of its elite marines. On December 15, 1981, Admiral Anaya instructed his commander of naval operations, Vice Admiral Juan José Lombardo, to finish the plan for a conquest of the Falkland Islands in complete secrecy on the basis of the one Anaya had first prepared in 1977. Lombardo prepared the plan in handwritten form to keep the Air Force from blocking it. Anaya had obtained support from General Galtieri for the consideration of an invasion of the Falkland Islands in exchange for his political support in Galtieri's appointment as president. Now, although President Galtieri believed that the military regime needed a resounding triumph to reinvigorate itself, and that success lay in foreign policy, for him, the Falkland Islands was not to be it. Upon becoming president, his immediate goal was weakening the Air Force and the Navy and cancelling the invasion of the Falkland Islands. It was only when Galtieri failed to contain and subordinate the Navy that he was compelled by Anaya on December 29, 1981, to at least show the plan to the Air Force. And the Air Force received it reluctantly. They were not eager to start a war with England. Planning, therefore, went ahead, but Galtieri had not agreed to implement it there was no plan to invade the Falkland Islands. Now, despite extensive planning, the invasion of the Falkland Islands was not decided upon until the third week of March 1982, three months later, by which time Galtieri was caught in a bidding war against Anaya for the support of military constituents, both in the Army, in the Navy, and the Air Force. Given that domestic constituents were in uproar over the failed economic and social policies of Galtieri's regime, he was desperate to retain support at least within the military services. Therefore, once negotiations broke down with Great Britain the same week over the islands, Galtieri was compelled by the other services to approve the invasion in order to stay in power. And this occurred a week later. A day before the invasion, Galtieri was warned after consulting with U.S. President Ronald Reagan that Argentina would be on its own. And when Galtieri informed the junta of the warning by the U.S., Anaya told him, well, it's too late to change the plan. The Navy is already en route. Now, only retrospectively do we have a statement from Colonel Bernardo Menendez, an Interior Ministry liaison for the President, that indicates the fact that some persons did recognize the diversionary potential of the Falkland Islands. Quote, triumph in the Falklands might have historically justified the government of the armed forces. Close quote. A Gallup poll taken in all of the districts of Buenos Aires shortly after the invasion found that 90% of Argentines supported the war with only 8% against. Furthermore, 82% discounted negotiations with England and only 15% thought it was worthwhile. There is evidence that the military became aware of its public support after the war had started and this affected its decision on May 3rd and 4th to conduct the Exocet missile attacks on the British Navy as well as forcing Galtieri to consider how he could shift blame after Port Stanley surrendered to the British. However, there is no evidence that public support was a direct factor in Galtieri's decision to execute the invasion or for any member of the junta. The Navy wanted the invasion for nationalist reasons and Galtieri wanted the Navy's support to remain in power. The Falkland Islands were invaded because the Navy believed they belonged to Argentina and were drawn to it after peace was concluded with Chile over the Beagle Channel and President Galtieri agreed simply to stabilize his regime with service support. It was not a diversionary war. 
Now let's look at the case of the October 1978 Uganda-Tanzania War. This is research done by one of my students, Andrew Mambo, who took this course many years ago, and we published an article together based on his class paper. Now Andrew's case is grounded in his theory that a state's leader will pursue a diversionary theory of war given the opportunity to scapegoat, given domestic economic crises that have caused domestic unrest, which are more common in developing countries with rising expectations and a state structure without institutional checks and balances upon a leader's decision making. So Uganda obtained independence on October 9th, 1962 under King Mutesa II of the Buganda tribe, the largest tribe in Uganda. Uganda's parliamentary multi-party system was racked by instability and corruption, and this led to a coup by the Prime Minister Milton Obote. Obote's socialist policies worsened Uganda's economy and led Idi Amin, the head of the military, to seize control in a coup on January 25, 1971. Obote fled to Tanzania with sanctuary and support of Tanzania's leader, Julius Nyerere. And there, Obote organized a small guerrilla force and was defeated while reinvading Uganda by Idi Amin loyalists. Idi Amin retaliated by bombing parts of Tanzania with aircraft for two days. And this led to the October 7, 1972 Mogadishu Agreement in which Tanzania agreed to disarm Obote's little army. Here you can see a picture of Idi Amin. This is Julius Nyerere, the president of Tanzania. Now, President Idi Amin had a history of domestic scapegoating. Before he began blaming problems on Tanzania, he blamed the white British population for Uganda's poverty. And then he blamed, and in August 1972, expelled 70,000 South Asian Indians who were involved in intermediate commerce in Uganda. In 1977, coffee prices plummeted, reducing Amin's revenue and his ability to buy his army's loyalty. Amin was not a Ugandan. He was actually a Sudanese Nubian, and therefore he sought to shift attention away from that distinction within Uganda. In May of 1977, Amin began blaming Tanzania for Uganda's economic problems. Amin also blamed Tanzania for a number of military invasions, which he claimed Uganda successfully repelled, all without any basis. Nyerere simply ignored Amin's accusations as ludicrous. This is a picture of Milton Obote, the original socialist prime minister who had sanctuary in Tanzania. The economic crisis made it impossible to pay the, mil to pay the army and provide the allotment of free beer, and this led to a series of mutinies in society, government, and the military. Amin knew that attempts to use the military domestically would break it apart. Amin also wanted his debts to Libya and Saudi Arabia to be forgiven. So here you can see Uganda and Tanzania. The blue indicates where Uganda invaded Tanzania. So Amin decided to provoke a war with Tanzania to distract the attention of his military that he relied upon to suppress the population. So he was not trying to divert the population as much as the military. Amin declared that the Kagera salient was part of Greater Uganda, a completely fabricated claim. The Kagera salient is based on the Kagera River that you can see as a blue line just across the common Ugandan-Tanzanian border. You can see it depicted here in pink. So Idi Amin moved his military to the Tanzanian border. Julius Nyerere of Tanzania simply ignored Amin and uh, left its frontier with Uganda unprotected by the TPDF, the Tanzanian People's Defense Forces. On October 25th, 1978, Uganda invaded Tanzania through four points on the border, and the few Tanzanian forces in the area under Colonel Morris Singano, who was primarily responsible for stopping smuggling, retreated. Amin's media reported that in retaliation to a Tanzanian invasion on November 1st, that had penetrated 15 kilometers into Uganda, Uganda had retaliated counterattacked and occupied the Kagera salient and annexed 1,200 kilometers of territory. 
The Tanzanian military took a few months to mobilize and then easily pushed the Ugandan army out of the Kagera salient, further invaded Uganda with 20,000 soldiers all the way to the Sudanese border, forcing Idi Amin to flee to Libya and then to Saudi Arabia after the occupation of the capital Kampala on April 10, 1979. Given that the military was oblivious to the Gagara salient and that Idi Amin engaged in war with Tanzania without any evidence of a Tanzanian threat, the only existing motive by a process of elimination is a diversionary motive for war. Given Amin's total control of the government and the presence of an economic crisis, his attempt succeeded in unifying his army, though he should have foreseen that he had no hope of success against the Tanzanian army.